I'm going to hit record. All right. Hello, gang, and welcome to the fourth virtual Wells College Visiting Writers Series event for the fall 2020 semester. Um, as always, I need to start by thanking NISCA, the New York State Council for the Arts, without whose generous support we couldn't host events with incredible writers like the two we have for you tonight. Um, my name is Dan Rosenberg. I'm the director of the Visiting Writers Series, and here's the plan for tonight. Um, after I'm done talking, I'll turn it over to Andrew Zawacki, who will read for about 20 minutes, and then I'll pop back in to invite Joshua Harmon to read for the same time. And at the end, we'll have an opportunity for questions for both of them from you, the audience. Um, you'll all be muted as you are now, but there is a chat option, and I invite you to type in questions or comments sort of throughout the, um, throughout the reading into the chat. Um, because we have two readers tonight and they each have limited time to share their work, I'm not going to interrupt them to pose your questions mid-reading like I normally do, but it'll be lovely to have them in the chat so that at the end when we start our Q&A, they'll already be there and, and we can kick it off like that. During that Q&A, I'll also give you the option to use the raise hand feature of Zoom, which you can find under participants, I believe. And if you do that, I will unmute you so you can ask your question yourself. Um, either one works, um, though my personal preference would be to hear your voice because um, I talk a lot in these things and it would be nice to hear you instead. So that's the big plan, all right? And now it is my honor to introduce our two poets tonight. The first thing you might notice upon opening up either of these books, um, Andrew Zawacki's Unsung or Joshua Harmon's The Soft Path, is that the language misbehaves. Words are broken apart or jammed together, sentences stutter and stumble, the rhetorical ground beneath us feels unsteady. Both of these poets engage in these books in this linguistic play to create a modern form of eco-poetics that understands technology as central to all aspects of our lived experience, particularly the experience of engaging with nature and all of its interconnectedness. We don't have any pretty stable lyrics about how nice that one tree is here. Instead, we have landscapes mediated by the camera and the windshield and the torqued language reflects the difficulty of the relationship between the natural and the technological. Um, I personally think that there's no other way in our current moment to think ecologically. We can't go back to Wordsworth describing daffodils and imagining his sister wasn't there just so he can be lonely as a cloud not with Wi-Fi hotspots and microphones we can't turn off in all of our pockets. So Zawacki's book is described as an inquiry into the possibilities and dangers of a global pastoral. And Harmon's book has been called a remarkable book of eco-poetics in the mode of ethical vision, poetic exemplification, and elegant reality check which is all just to say that despite the obvious love of language and language play that drives both of these books, these are poets, not just of the word, but of the world. And first up, we're going to hear from Andrew Zawacki and I'm not gonna read their bios to you. You got here because you saw some posting that told you their bios. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about his most recent book, Unsung. Um, students who have taken translation theory with me may hear echoes in here of Paul Ceylon's fractured lyrics and the attentive details of Wang Wei. Um, both of whom we look at in that, in that class. Um, we find in here sonnets that don't look much like sonnets, poems accompanied by Zawaki's own black and white photographs and language corralled from the far reaches of English and beyond. There's a fair amount of French in here, Zawaki himself being bilingual. Um, bi, just the two of them, Drew? Eh-ish, yeah. bi plus, we'll call it. <laughs> um, um, so through this diversity of approaches, Unsung looks closely at what one reviewer called our collective disaster. The nature of this disaster is manifold. The disaster of parenting in the midst of climate collapse, the disaster of human imagination, the disaster of our intellect's failure to adequately address what are ultimately our spiritual limitations. But lest you fear I've invited endless downers to read to you tonight, I want to emphasize that there's also love here and joy that anxiety about parenting is inextricable from the delight Zawaki takes in his children. This is the ending of one sonnet in a sequence of sonnets for and kind of by his older daughter. 
And when I say emergency or mine, I mean, I love you. What body ain't a climbing wall for daughter you keep breaking into song? As a dad in these ugly times and a part-time climbing wall myself, I agree. So Andrew Zawacki, please give us a taste of this incredible book. Well, thank you. It's really lovely to be here and to see all of you or your monikers. I see Sheer Dents here. Hello. It's been a long time since we caught up. I can't remember the last time I saw you, but it's, I'm glad you're here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on the road, as it were, with Josh Harmon. We've done a number of uh, sort of reading trips together. I don't know if this counts as a reading trip or not, but sure, why not? In some ways, this is more appropriate to our books, I think. Um, I had the great pleasure, of course, of teaching Dan at the University of Georgia. I didn't do much teaching to him. He didn't need much teaching, but he was, officially speaking anyway, my student. Um, and so it's always kind of a lesson in uh, eloquence and elegance and intelligence to hear his prose. And I think this may be the first time I've been the subject of that eloquence and ele elegance. And it's really, uh, well, it's flattering to hear. It's lovely to be here. Um, Josh and I had been hoping to be on your campus, you know, obviously like last April, I think it was going to be. Um, and it's so silly to think now that we even held out the possibility in mid-March that maybe it would be okay in another couple days or weeks or something like that. That all seems pitifully short-sighted now. Um, but nonetheless, I'm really happy to see this Brady Bunch square of people in front of me. Um, I thought I would read um, a half a dozen poems from the new book, and I'm going to try to do this just off of my screen. I'm assuming, Dan, you just read that introduction off the screen. I haven't done this yet, um, but it's too dark out here by my little campfire to read the book itself. Um, so I have the manuscript queued up. Um, as Dan said, the book is called Unsun. The subtitle is F11. That's an F-stop or an aperture stop on a camera. And the book is kind of loosely, very loosely organized according to photographic um, constraints or parameters. Um, I thought I would read a half a dozen poems that uh, are distributed throughout the book. Um, there are 11 of them. There are many 11s in the book. Uh, but six of them that would have been under a sequence called trace route if I had given the sequence a title. But because they're so discreet and dispersed, I decided not to title them. But this is what they might sound like if they were to be reconstructed uh, um, or put back together one with another. And now I need to find my screen. I'm going to move you all down and move my poems up. Okay. This poem is called Strewn Field. I don't have a lot to say by way of anecdote between my poems. Um, in the rare case where I might, I will let you know. Um, strewn field. Everything I say is a meteor shower. Liar O2, folie El Neuf, flowchart of my daughter as, as if. At a hidden site in the Shutterstock Desert, desat in a stage of siege, the color water is when water is fleecing a fissile titanium sky. An error event has occurred and still will. The feck if anyone knew, forcing the planar air gap sign to fly off in every direction. Like a shepherd tone, amassing its arcuate notes to attention no eardrum can take. Door 108 an avgas spill, and the target tricked out to resemble an asset, her intelligence actionable. Half transistor, half self, my voice is flensed mid-flight inside the glare between two screens. A bezeled Citibank tower in blue and the NASDAQ ticker spitting its intraday figures and decimal squall. An absence of song is foley mixing the other empty sounds. Under a film set sunset at gamma 0 0.7, they're scaling up the latest war to tell us who we are. This next poem, uh, I can tell you with only um, minor amounts of shame. I wrote it just after watching um, Blade Runner 2046 on the big screen back when we could go to movie theaters. So this is called Outside a Ruined Casino. Harrison Ford is not in this, but you may picture him. Uh, this is kind of the casino I have in mind. Outside a Ruined Casino. The sky is not falling, it's failing. 
as the rain band docks his trees in a wiretap wind. Seismic seven, the plastosphere swelling, 413 AR. Here's what little I know about going about it. Cold black city streets in an outage, kinky blowdown, a tape on a loop, the scuffed muscle and worn bone of a rotator cuff like a door come off its hinge. A prettiness to break my face against or the government's. The sky is flailing, a hoax, a helix. It's daylight and algorithm of textured demos in Perlin noise on a dome. And every time the sunshine dims, the system is in for thin. The afternoon twitching in AFib with fog at the far end of town, slinking like a tectonic crack, shellacked in iPhone glass, my data shadow flickers along the paywall and casts me out. A whisper through the dark net, a pearl, Foxfield at Evenfall. There was a little reference to a rotator cuff problem there, which some of you older folks in the audience might commune with. Um, this is the opening poem in the book, and it's called Optic Audio. I'm often fascinated by the ways in which the vocabularies of audio technologies are used to talk about uh, the technologies of visual uh, and vice versa. And so optic audio is one of those places where I found um, what sounds almost like an oxymoron, of course, but we talk about um, image noise, for example, photographic noise. And I'm, I'm kind of seduced by the ways in which the vocabularies of, of um, orality and aurality are often used interchangeably, this is very synesthetically. Optic audio, thrown through the midtown under drone, insomniac after hours, a centrifugal capital free for all in free fall down a wind to flay a sea if there were sea. I can hear not hearing, the sound of the losing of sound, filiform like the white of a bridal train. Loop two, a nuclear powered carrier force in waters off the coast. Every surface tension covers a sesh it can't contain. The horizon and tumbled howlite, drusen, strontium 90, gate 43, the rookin figure transmitting at intervals 2340, 1105, alive inside the binary light as a phase in the flight of a bullet. The report, when it reaches me, ununique and sequel-esque, a string of quantum noise goes in one ear and out the eyes. This next poem is in three stanzas of seven lines. Is there a name for a seven line stanza, Dan, anyone? It's got 21 lines. Um, it's called Backscatter. The day brings minor violences made in the image of money. Dirty martini sunlight, sluggish, airplanes taking off and touching down inside my ears, a collapse of reflective weather on radar, its red blotches moving out, a panic amassing in paranormal fog. Sheathed in UV Duratrans with an earthquake under the skin, I skew in relation to market flux, a doliprane ibuprofen regimen. At night, it's a samurai war in the air, a burning behind the film. By six in the morning, the mortar shelling is real. Obviously, I thought a lot about war when writing this book. When you live in the United States, you sort of never aren't thinking about war, I suppose. Um, but this was the first time I think it made its way so forcefully into the poems for better or worse. Like I'd rather write about something else, you know, um, but sometimes there isn't anything else to write about. You're stuck with your subject matter. This is called Music for Attack Helicopter. I think I stole the title. Um, from Dominique Forcad, but I'm not sure about that. I need to backtrack and figure out if indeed I did steal it. If I did, he's not thanked in the, uh, in the acknowledgements in the back of the book. I did mention him in an interview in one place. Music for attack helicopter. 
The punch card skyline from here to tarnation as seen through a sumilux darkly. The power grid, a scaffolded arbor, empty billboards advertising, advertising space, gantry cranes in the harbor, a calyx of gaunt red ideograms, chicken scratch commuter traffic blurring the eyebrow bridge. I'm a dislodged calc of liquid finance, hellbent on making the Zurich flight at 5 fucking 30 a.m. in transit across a Minecraft metropole is what I am, a cursive crack in the windshield of nobody's car. And I'll close with a poem that actually does have a little um, anecdote to it. The poem is called Snow Flack, which is to say snowflake with its E having fallen off. This was the way my daughter Ella, who's now 10 and spells pretty well, uh, but maybe when she was five, let's say, not last year, uh, was spelling snowflake for a story of hers at school and she left the E off. Um, and I just thought it was the coolest looking word I'd seen in a really long time. So this isn't officially one of the poems that go into her sonnets uh, that, as Dan mentioned, she helped to write sort of without knowing it, but I did nonetheless steal this phrase from her. I remember it made Josh Harmon sort of jealous, which was great because he's often coming up with portmanteau and neologisms that I feel like stealing. But, you know, once someone tells you they're theirs, you can't really take it. Snowflack, and thanks for listening. Climbing in the fall line, an avalanche on the verge of the tongue, a splurge might trigger a surge of further spending pending funding. S1, S2 with a neutral filter, lance leaf yellow, alyssum white, my brain a splash of keshi pearls, a shot of bullet, neat, by applying the platform to other verticals. You cannot step into the infidel water, ghost lit and hexed with a glitch in its patch, the kaleidoscopic asteroid trench, a backdoor in the encryption protocols. The pre-dawn branches are toothed with a freeze, like a mirror right after a fist, a calligraphy of brittle sutras wheezing through the dark. Please wait while the subscriber you're trying to reach. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. That was fantastic. It was really a delight that you can see people clapping, which is one of the horrors of this space. And also the horror of the recording is that that won't be visible on the recording. It'll just be me telling you that other people are clapping, but it was wonderful. I should also note that um, Drew is most of the reason why I chose to go to UGA for my PhD. Um, so I've, I've been an admirer of, of his work for a very long time. And I'm so glad that we got you up here virtually at least. Um, this, is, um, this is really wonderful. Um, next up, we do have Joshua Harmon, whose new book, The Soft Path, contains just three poems, a short lyric, a longer poem in sections, and a very, very long poem without sections. Um, most of the pages in the book reveal a relatively skinny column of text. Um, let me see, that's not a good example, but here we go. Um, and when we learn that Harmon began composing much of this book during a new two hour one way commute, it would be easy to imagine those endless columns of text as metaphors for the highway relentlessly passing by on the move, offering in Harmon's own words, only a superficial relationship to the places that one might, but often doesn't stop along the way. In an interview, Harmon noted how the experience of reading the book might mimic his experience of writing it. He said, and this is all a quote, when I showed a friend a draft of the manuscript, he confronted with the 45 unbroken pages of horizontal dropouts asked me, do you even like your readers? Of course I do, but I wanted the form of this book to be exhausting itself since it describes so much that, I've been, that has been exhausted in our world, time, place, privacy, the non-performative self. So reading this book, I was so grateful for that exhaustion, which became for me a kind of quietude. In my endless lived whirlwind of childcare and teaching and cleaning, and now we have a dog, um, Josh's book enforced for me an incredibly welcome remove. The long poem he mentioned in that interview both begins and ends with this phrase, I, in between, 
unreachable elsewhere otherwise. It's a balm to think so. Um, so I'm going to ask Josh Harmon to unmute himself and it worked successfully. Amazing. Please share with us some of the soft path. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all for being here. Thanks to Drew for reading to you. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm, first of all, I'm super sad that I'm not gonna have a backing track of cricket noise during my reading. Drew and I were talking um, earlier about where we might choose to read. So I, I was thinking, uh, he said, I'm, I'm gonna read on my porch with a fire going. I thought, wow, I'd love to go out on my deck and set up a fire pit in the yard, but um, I'm even further north and east than Drew is. I'm, I'm uh, joining you tonight from Western Massachusetts. So here it starts, this time of year, it starts getting dark around, I don't know, five o'clock or so. And then another month, it'll be getting dark around 4 p.m. And um, so I thought, you know, there's there's no way I can do that. So instead I'm, I'm reading to you from uh, the basement of my house where my wife has her Zoom office set up. And it reminded me of a reading I did back in, I wanna say 2006 maybe in Buffalo, New York, where there was a whole collective of people who had these old houses, old Victorian houses with um, uninsulated, these giant uninsulated attics. And they had a reading series there called the Panic in the Attic Readings, but it was only, operational for like a month or six weeks every year because they had to hit that sweet spot between when it was cool enough to not roast up there but warm enough to not freeze up there so we would be in people's houses and then all of a sudden like go up to the attic I guess they had chairs set up it was kind of wonderful so this is my um, response I'm not on my deck I'm in the basement um, and I'm actually going to read to you from uh, Horizontal Dropouts, that 45 page poem that makes up the, the bulk of this book. Uh, when I've read from it before, I've usually started at the beginning and gone about seven pages or so. Um, but I think what I'm gonna do tonight is actually start at the point where I normally leave off because um, as Dan pointed out, this is a poem that in some ways mimics a commute. It begins and ends in the same place. It feels endless. It uh, taxes your patience. It taxes my it taxes. It took me years to write, and there were some points where I would literally just stop in the middle of a line or just put it away for two or three weeks before I could even bear to go back to it. Um, there's not really a narrative, um, so I don't really need. To, you're not really missing much if you missed the first seven pages. I mean, there's some sort of linguistic stuff that gets set up for you, I suppose. Um, but th this part that I want to read, um, because number one, I am still jealous of Snowflack. Uh, but this passage that I'm going to read includes uh, my coinage, microchasm, which I believe Drew was very jealous of when he first encountered that in the manuscript I sent him at one point. So uh, I'm glad we at least get to, you know, try to show each other up t tonight um, or, you know, refresh jealousies, as it were. Um, but this also, this passage is, is um, sort of a fall passage um, that relates to what would happen on my long, these long commutes is I would often take the most expeditious route to work because I was late, I was harried, I would go straight to the parking lot, ditch my car, run to my office, rush to the classroom. But on the way back, I was such a diminished shell of myself that I couldn't even bear to drive on a busy road. And I would sort of digress onto these smaller and smaller roads. Uh, one thing that I did as a kind of um, antidote to all this car time was um, became a really obsessive cyclist uh, starting about 10 years ago. And um, so part of, partly I was also um, searching out new roads to ride my bike on. And I was actually riding some of these roads that this, this passage references yesterday, which also made me think of it. So this is um, a little bit of the middle from Horizontal Dropouts, the title of which is supposed to, I guess, reference not only the feeling of literally going over the horizon every day, which I was doing, um, but also sort of all the dropouts in technology and the kind of, this is a poem about location and dislocation. I felt like I existed nowhere um, during the time of this composition really. Um, I can no longer reside in the fictions overlaying an event already wrinkled by scrutiny. 
blunted with recordings ripped into flash memory at 320 kbps. The boredom of a fixed location, a hitch in the throat from saying too much or too little, a landscape observed in portrait orientation, a rendering engine, a post encryption tree line, a compression algorithm so the file fits. The sound I heard and the sound I dreamed I heard. Wind through the smallest apertures, endlessly consoling treble chant of crickets. Bee bothered purple asters, softening sand striped back roads these diminishing afternoons before work crews clear cut 20 yard swaths verging the interstate. In another year or two years, blackberry and burdock thicket will grow back among unground stumps and limbs left to weather on the hillside. But now, how to memorize scrub brush and saplings fed into a chipper's hydraulic hopper, heaps of trees. The swift diminishment of daylight this month indexes the Earth's elliptical orbit. So the pleasures of a roots routine remain the only ones one's allowed oneself to feel. As grapevines persistent perfume yields to the litter of discarded defaulted maple leaves, cars scatter moving past rapid exteriors. It looked through the fogged windshield like the sunset contained its own motion and motioned our containments. Seven Mile River, Five Mile River, deoxygenated lesser ponds, Sucker Brook, Winnemusset Brook, several seeps and intermittent rills, Ware River. The spaciousness of the narrowest valleys, the gestures I never used, memories, inevitabilities, an exhausted self unable to stay put, but longing for this moment to suspend itself, this economy-sized sky to remain on infinite repeat. And nothing to do but keep driving at the same argument I already lost and no longer believe. Downshift to third to crest the rise, the ride hesitates and the sound approaches and exceeds zero decibels, drops out from 027 to 032, some hard drive glitch, overwritten bits. Got stuck behind a farm plate truck, well below the limit along tire worn double yellow, aged asphalt nearly invisible under sand and a runoff. Nothing but surface and verge, cattails and phragmites shedding fluff in a shrub bog as violet hours slump into the terms silence sets and point blank dusk dissolves a day's scriptures. As you revise, you might consider Hawthorne rooted to an eroding road bank. I wanted a phrase to speak for an absence of endings, impossibly. The last late day downed light, only a shiny speck aloft, tracking at Mach 0.85. Solar reflections on 7075 T6 aluminum skin and the paired vapor trails turbines loose. But amid stripped trees off 148 North, nothing's left to explain an innate resistance to civilization's force multipliers, but cordwood stacked in a driveway. I once believed in the linear relationship between a starved fire's sideways smoke and a severance contained inside parentheses between depleted chances and a drive to the next town, but not the town after that, 
or the one after an inventory of what we might exchange for these unfaithful orchards. A planning board draft for an 81 acre parcel, a court ordered survey for a transcontinental cable line. The application of Mass General Law, Chapter 40B, believed in the buyback program for a crossroads sugar bush, in the affidavit of frost-proof foreign chrysanthemums blooming cerise and amaranth and titian under the same dull skies as always. In everything I believed before a proper valuation. Two radio towers south of Wine Road blink above a hummocked pasture's long grass shadows encircled by electrified wire. Dusk doubles the afternoon's overcast and slow mo snows of yellow birch and ash leaves from the fenced off government property break up the footage from the feed. Water's least resistant path downhill explains the most recognizably human element of this place, but not the only human element. An heirloom, a penalty, a little careless music to ease one's passage, a routing number for the automated monthly direct deposit, bad data as the signal drifts, an impossible cadence, another vapid interior registering its say-so. And the 25-year return comes in on an unrepaired dam, the remains of glacial retreat, a credit check. Nothing can be restored, not even a duplicate file. And night again, offset supermoon disk slips above Pataquatic, clear of ad blocked clouds to legitimize this record. Overheads, only a seamless stitched sphere of digitized stars. I can surrender hours too, years even, but what do you call it? when the progress bar hangs up before the end and refuses to finish. And whatever finishes, not concrete feelings of awe, not the occasion to become a footprint, a footnote. The class 8C truck idling off the off-ramp, amber running lights that seem as real as the leftovers of self-concern. The rain did this, not me. And a null space after the inevitable encounter, what happens every autumn, a present tense burial, a microchasm of months I never think will arrive until they arrive, a window open overnight to admit cold air. The road bottoming one of the loneliest valleys I know changes surface and name three times as it crosses town lines, its last mile engineered at a steady grade to escape those steep slopes, straight mark across contours impossible to depict on the page. An ancient rift zone where the river was downfaulted a thousand feet. If this isn't what makes me, I don't know what does. Years. And what rises as smoke over Kinnebrook, gray against grayer day, under the expanding cumulus cloud field, an energetic disturbance aloft. The company picked over the last narrow stopes in the Emery mine a century back, the visible supply expended, the mill that ground a ton an hour, another asset depreciated to worthlessness along the ankle-deep river, leaf-lace-winged green darners hover lower than bent maples, skimming rock-tumbled ripples. No matter what clarifies my relief at proper names, the inexpressiveness of the world as I see it on screen prevails. The plug-in operating in compatibility mode 
horse quits the wind's music of there to here. The interior temperature falls to 60 amid emptiest sun-blown middle day. I learned another detour through outlying hills where Temek 15G soaked rocky topsoil, wrecked a rill, ruined wells, but the town extended the water main. And just below Tekoa, two lanes expand to three for the climb. Scrub oak and pitch pine emboss scratched strata of mica slate over a brush fire scar. A rattle can sunset overloads a few pixels, but reveals the otherwise unseeable patterns and contrails evaporate into edgelessness, micro narratives of exile. What day doesn't feel composed of obstructions? Even the sun gets filmed by cloud cover, like the subject I elide and then restore in a memo, as if to clarify my own week-long absences from the most familiar auto-corrected history. But this new crisis is built from the scraps of the previous crises and the unsettled index of opinion. Everything post-peak. The woods understory and overstory, fuel for fire weather. 89 octane, 42 cetane, E85 flex fuel, scent of unburnt hydrocarbons, sand spilled by the pump to soak a diesel overflow, sand spilled for traction on the data scraped slope. Scarborough Brooks surge beside delaminating pavement. A defeat device for the emissions check. A brute force device to ease the ascent. One wing flaps up in an asphalt scouring wind, but the rest of the sparrow is pulped in the lane. Another multipath ghost reflected between a steel tower on steerage rock and an unshielded RCA input to a dusty screen, someone still watches. A coding break to consider the decomposition of a freak year, underwintered and annulled by its own vanishing. I'll stop there. Thank you all for listening. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I will officially announce that people are clapping silently. It's really wonderful. Um, thank you so much. That is great. Um, and now, now we can turn with some time left for um, a Q&A. So I will invite you all to use the raise hand feature if you would like to speak up and um, then you'll be able to unmute yourself and and say your question aloud. But in the interim, there were things that popped up in the chat that we can start with, gang. Um, the first thing is uh, septet, Drew. Um, <laughs> that's the, the seven line stanza. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. And a question from Lila, who asks, Andrew, when you said you would rather write poems about other things, but sometimes the subject sticks with you, what is that writing process like for you? Yeah, that's a really great question. And thank you for that. The two of you look so cozy on the couch. It's nice. Um, that's what I'm headed after. The, I mean, I'm not headed to your couch, but I'm headed to a couch after this is all done. Um, yeah, I've been kind of rolling that around in the back of my mind while Josh was reading. I mean, I don't know how much if Timothy Morton's work on hyper objects means anything to anybody here in the virtual room or not. Um, but I've been... Uh, I've been interested in the way recently for me, and it's been the case for poets forever, you know, I'm sort of maybe just new out of privilege or out of a lack of awareness or something. I'm probably a little bit new to this feeling about writing, but um, I wrote a book this summer, for example, um, as a long way around getting to your question. And, you know, I didn't want it to be a pandemic diary. It, it inevitably is in some way. I mean, even when I did my best to sort of keep the pandemic out of it, 
the pandemic would be an exemplary case of of a hyper object, right? It's this it's this thing that's out there and in here all the time. Um, Timothy Morton talks about hyper objects the way Pascal talked about God, that his center was everywhere and the circumference was nowhere. Why am I mentioning all this? It's not to have a lesson on the hyper object. It's because there's a certain way in which when I'm writing now and have been for several years, there's just this viscous stuff out there and in here that won't go away regardless of whether you ignore it or not, right? Um, so I mentioned war as being one of those things, and I don't know that Timothy Morton talks about war specifically as a hyper object, but it might as well be one now, which is to say, even when I'm not interested in writing about war as a subject, and I think I probably rarely am, I mean, I have no experience really with war. I've never been a soldier. I'm not ostensibly in a country uh, that's at war in this country, but of course we are at every single corner. Uh, it's, it sticks to you and it's viscous and it's on you whether you decide to sort of acknowledge it or not. So in those circumstances, um, and the pandemic is the best example I can think of since it's in the air, uh, you know, there's no avoiding it. So when you're asking me what the writing process is like, I feel like I'm trapped all the time when I write. And, you know, I'd love to like break out and just use my imagination and create another world or something, or I'm... I'm wedded to my distractions that my kids provide until I stop and think, you know, my kids aren't really distractions. They're also stuck in this web called the pandemic and this web called climate change um, and global warming. And like, they're going to have to deal with it long after I do. So my experience at the moment in the last couple of years of writing has actually been pretty far from what I think maybe brought me to it or what motivates my students often, you know, who are kind of new to the mode, which has to do with kind of liberation and maybe self-expression, self-identification, um, all the kinds of things that I believe in as properties of art, you know, that, that I believe are like the reasons we come to the kinds of artistic practices we come to. They give us something more than ourselves and they put us on the edge of ourselves and they put us in the face of risk. We discover things doing them. But recently, it's not to say the poems I hope are, are all downers. It's not because their subject matter is always tough stuff, but I feel more freighted, F-R-E-I-G-H-T-E-D than I ever did while I write. And it's really not out of some need to like speak responsibly or talk like the 50 year old that I will be pretty soon or talk like a father or, you know, it's not about trying to mature. It's just being increasingly aware that we're caught in political and meteorological and technological webs and matrices everywhere, including when we hide and including uh, when we're in isolation and in lockdown and so on, that, that it's, we're always enmeshed. And of course, again, it's always been the case in the world, but I feel like by Timothy Morton's uh, criticism, it, we, we move in and out of phase with it at various points and we experience it on a local level at various points. So the most local level to experience the pandemic would be having it, I suppose, or knowing someone who has it. I mean, for me, that hasn't happened yet. So my my interface with something like the pandemic has been relatively abstract, sort of, except that, you know, just outside my door, there are decisions that need to be made about what to do it about it. And, and within my own body, there are stressful reactions to it. So you ask what the writing process is like. It's kind of um, it's the only thing I sort of know what to do about it with, because uh, it's not going away. And so walking through it, exercising it, exorcising it, um, putting it to the test, trying to get around it. Um, I think that's what the writing process feels like now. That's not the same thing I would have said a couple of years ago. Um, and yeah. That's, that's very cool. <laughs> Thank, thanks. Josh, I might, I might pivot to you with a, a, I wanted to ask you both a sort of a more nitty gritty thing that I maybe will get to in a minute, but that seems like such an interesting segue. And there are people just um, saying lovely things in the, in the chat about both of your readings. So um, do look at that and be celebrated as well. But um, a question that I would, I would turn to you, Josh, is also like, have you felt your process and your experience change over the past few years? Like how has 
um, maybe the the energy that brought you to poetry originally shifted or not um, in recent years. Mm, yeah, process is always changing, right? I mean, I hope that that's the goal anyway. It, I feel like if process isn't changing, there's something wrong uh, with me. And and to get to the last part of your question first, maybe um, the idea of what brought me to poetry. I started as a prose writer. I was um, bound and determined to be a novelist and a short story writer. I, when I was an undergraduate, poetry was a language I didn't speak. It was a country I didn't visit. It was um, you know, completely foreign to me. I took no poetry courses as an undergraduate whatsoever. Uh, I mean, I read some poetry. I, I knew some poets, but um, it always, uh, it just wasn't what I was interested in at the time. Um, and at a certain point in graduate school, fiction came to see the most seem the most tiresome, uh, you know, sort of traditional, inescapable set of techniques that I could imagine. And I couldn't, at a certain point, I just couldn't bear to read fiction. And I, I often, I, I really don't anymore. And the only fiction that I read now is is mostly older uh, stuff. I'm always impressed that Drew's reading all these new novels and, and whatnot. And I just think, well, I don't think I can read a novel that's been published since, you know, 1980 or something and, and, and preferably older than that. Um, it's, it, I feel like any, when I read a, a novel or a story now, it's just sort of watching this really creaky machinery lurch into motion and I, I just immediately lose interest in that. And that's sort of true even with, with films and with TV shows, everybody loves narrative, but I, I, I kind of hate it, to be honest. Um, and I feel like the last while has been um, in some way an escape from narrative. I get bored by films, I get bored by TV. I don't really want to watch what everybody's watching. Um, you know, a narrative is inescapable. You know, we're always trying to impose it in some way or another, I guess. Um, but anyway, I don't know, this is getting really far afield from your original question. Pretty soon I'm gonna start talking about hyperobject theory. Um, so uh, process, sure. Um, you know, I think uh, I'm a big believer in daily process and that was not at all what I did with this book. Uh, this is a book that took a long time to write because, you know, you said you at the beginning of the reading, you had hoped that uh, you, you, you were reassuring the audience that you had not invited people to two people to read real downer stuff. And I think, man, I don't know, this book is a real downer book because I was feeling incredibly down when I wrote most of it, right? Um, it's, it's sort of literally about dislocation and sort of uh, moving from a place where I had been for a long time and had a ton of friends and a job I loved to a sort of much more uncertain place in my life. Um, and, you know, not really by choice, right? I mean, this was all sort of all happened in the wake of the 2008 recession. Um, there was also, you know, to get to what Drew was saying about climate change and, you know, all sort of all these matrices in which we we're enmeshed. Um, I used to walk to work. I lived um, you know, about a 10 minute walk to work. And all of a sudden I now had a 120 mile drive to where I worked. And, you know, my feeling of guilt about doing that was um, also profound. And then it was, you know, sort of compounded by the fact that I thought, well, I'll get one of those, you know, at the time we had a 10 year old car, which in fact we still have, now it's 20 years old and we still drive it. And I have no interest in replacing it until I absolutely need to, because I think um, cars are the thing that I might claim as the most destructive force of the 20th century, um, the automobile, maybe even more so than nuclear weapons, I don't know. Um, but in any case, I got one of those Volkswagen diesels and I thought, well, this is great. I can get 48 miles per gallon of fuel driving this long route. And then of course it came out that uh, those cars were not clean the way they had been marketed and had a, an emissions defeat device, which was also in the part of the poem that I read tonight. So then I thought, well, oh, great. You know, the, the one thing that I thought was at least, you know, <clears throat> somewhat redeeming about this commute has proven to be anything but. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, my, my previous book of poems, Lisping to Poughkeepsie, was a poem that, uh, or a, a book that I basically wrote, I was writing two, three poems a day at times 
um, when I was was writing that poem. I wrote most of it in a, a fall and, and a winter and a little bit more in the spring, sort of like what Drew was doing this past summer when my phone was blowing up with constant poems that he was sending me from this book he was um, writing. And, um, you know, whereas this book, as I said, you know, the part of the reason these poems are so skinny as you put it on the page is, you know, I was coming to feel redundant, I think in a lot of ways and poetry was coming to feel redundant. I think literary expression in general was coming to feel redundant. Um, this book sort of coincided with the real rise of social media, right? Um, around 2010, 2011, whatever. And everybody had an opinion about everything. I don't know if you caught the reference in the poem. I said like another, something about the cars moving through rapid exteriors, but then a vapid interior registering its say so is my small protest against social media and the fact that everybody you know, can no longer just exist, but um, needs to constantly opine on everything and anything. And it basically chased me away from social media entirely. I, I barely can stand to look at it. And that's been the case for five years or more at this point. Um, just sort of this constant barrage of people's opinions and commenting on other people's opinions. And it was just overwhelming to me. So I think part of that trickled into not wanting to say anything until I felt sure that it, it was something I needed to say. Um, so I wrote this book very slowly, um, I guess, you know, which is not my typical process, um, as it were. As, I love that as a, as a concluding gesture to that answer. It's just <laughs> wrote it slowly. Yeah, um, that's fantastic. I'm myself up. Oh, no. OK, he's muted himself. Um, so I'm going to I put in the chat here just a couple of links um, so that people have access to buying these books um, from either our local bookstore around here, Buffalo Street Books, or Bookshop, which is a great online retailer that does um, book order fulfillment through independent bookstores rather than Amazon, or you can um, buy each of them directly from the publishers themselves. And those links are, are in the chat now and available to you. And I might just, as a, as a parting note, just thinking, Josh, about what you said about um, your, your distrust of or distaste for narrative and, um, and the appeal of that for many people, the comfort is tied to what I think you find tiresome, that sort of stability and predictability, right? The, the sense of a familiar machine going through its familiar paces. And the thing that struck me about both of your readings tonight is how you maybe necessarily, because this is a different medium than the printed page, elided a lot of the verbal complexity um, or the visual complexity of the poems. These poems, poems in both of these books break words apart, they, they introduce enjambment within a word. And I was thinking particularly, um, you didn't read this, this poem, Josh, but the very first um, section of Cascading Failures, the first line reads, snow against wind. And then the second line introduces the hyphen that would traditionally be tacked onto the end of wind and says, shield. And what that does for me as a reader is it forces me to read snow against wind, and then I have to stop and redo it, right? I have to readjust my reading. It's like, oh, snow against windshield, got it now. And snow against wind, smoothed and compressed, right? And like the poem goes on teaching you how to read it that way. But the reading is, I mean, from my experience of both of these books is that it's a slow process. It is a, these are, these are both books full of poems that don't allow me to relax into my customary mode of reading. They require a sort of sustained and active attentiveness because they're not playing that traditional game. And I mean, I guess that's my pitch for reading the poems to everyone instead of, instead of just hearing them from you. But also, I wonder if either of you would, would care to speak um, to maybe how, how you, like you, you chose to read them in a way to make them a little bit easier to hear, I think, easier to follow without someone having the book in front of them. But is that, is that move part of just like the pleasure of writing the poems? Is it integral to the, the sort of poetic project of these books, both of which feel like project books in that way? Like what's, what's the relationship between that feature that maybe doesn't survive in this mode of expression and, and the books as a whole? I'll speak quickly maybe and then let Drew jump in. Uh, um... I guess coming from prose and was the was basically the one thing that, that verse can do that prose can't do, right? Um, so I, I am, have always been really interested in 
um, and jamming things as much as I can. But in this book, it's um, there's another line of, you know, um, what survives a fragmented reading of fragments. And as I said, I mean, this book is for me a lot about fragmentation. So that in gem it got taken up a notch. Um, I don't know. I'll let Drew jump in if he wants. Well, I was thinking when Josh was talking before a little bit about input and output, you know, if those are maybe appropriate uh, sort of analog framework to think about this. He was saying it was a slow book to write and at various times he put it down and picked it back up. He was talking about a mistrust of social media in which everybody had to pop off, you know, it still does all the time about everything as if they're experts in, in whatever and not wanting to say anything until he felt sure that there was something worthwhile to say. That all sounds, you know, that kind of input, if you will, sounds like a filtering mechanism. You know, I'm thinking about the ways in which we filter our work before it shows up on paper. And that can be a really good or a bad thing. Um, many writers write as if they don't have a filter, right? You know, first thought, best thought. Um, the, the affect is one of spontaneity and one of sort of like immediacy and raw emotion or just raw observation. Some of the rest of us work very diligently to kind of like process, to use your word, to process what we're hearing and thinking and reading through many layers or vocoding mechanisms before it ends up on the page. And then there's a moment where it comes time to read them like tonight. Um, and like Josh, I've had a, and like you yourself, Dan, I've had a long, a relatively long history of giving readings like over two decades at this point, And I've gone in and out of many different um, approaches to what a reading should sound like or could be about. And I think at the moment or for the moment, I've just come to the conclusion that the kinds of the brokenness and the syntactical fragmentation and all of the kinds of things that I want a reader to be able to see on a piece of paper are just not possible to duplicate in an oral scenario without sounding really, really strange. And I speak from experience because I've tried. I mean, you will remember a book from a decade ago called Petals of Zero, Petals of One that has a long uh, end stopped set of uh, lyrics, 24 of them to match Zukovsky's kind of day. Every single word in there is broken along a right hand margin in kind of like extremely uncomfortable ways that set up kind of false cognates. And well, you know, like I read that in New York City once with Mark Strand of all people, you know, who's funny and anecdotal and the poems are so mellifluous. And, and then I got up after him and, and read these like concatenated, you know, broke down poems, like poems that I wanted to be like very smashed up, like little bits of windshield glass. Like to me, that was very pretty and also kind of harrowing in a way. And I was, I was kind of digesting the poetry of Gustav Sobin, which is also at the same time kind of mellifluous and broken. But I just realized in trying to do that aloud, in trying to kind of impersonate what was never meant as a voice, but was meant as a kind of visual voice to reuse my idea of kind of optic audio, it just didn't, I couldn't do it. It was like trying to speak the dialect of my poem or something. And it just sounded silly and it was so halting that you definitely got the picture, you know, you, you got what the effect was supposed to be, but at the expense of what I think, maybe I hope we heard tonight or some of the more kind of coherent thoughts or some of the, the flow through so that, I mean, I think what I'm often doing and, and this seems to me that what Josh is doing when I read his poems is that it's possible to be running a couple different circuits at once, right? And so even if all put back together, all reconstructed as some of my sentences maybe sound a little more like tonight, they can mean one thing. And then to be able to see them on the page and have that kind of run interference with what you thought you were hearing, to me, that sounds, now we're getting closer to Hopkins territory or something about counter stresses or, you know, kind of ways in which poems both disrupt themselves and move themselves forward. Dickinson does it all the time. I mean, the dashes in Dickinson's poems are both ways of kind of projecting herself forward and they're also at the same time things that hang her up. I mean, there's snags and methods of advance, right? And so I think for me, people like Hopkins, Ceylon, Dickinson, poets who are committed to both the visual and, you know, the oral Susan Howe, who are committed at once to kind of a projective, restless motion forward, but who at the same time are kind of find themselves being dragged back in some way. Um, there's a lot of reasons to want that to be a kind of aesthetic 
um, mechanism. Um, but I think, yeah, that account, like the concession to a listening public at any rate is to not tax their ears overly with like all of the hiccups in the poems, um, the stutters and the, and the false starts and so on. But I like them to be there. I wouldn't know how to do any of this without the paper in front of me. The page is really where it's at. I agree with that 100%. And I think also, well, if I can speak for Jew too, I think we're both really interested in the, in the materiality of language, right? I mean, you talked about the hyphen in that first line, and that's something that has come up in the typesetting of my last two, or the copy editing of my last two books, where I have some hyphens at the ends of lines and others at the beginning of lines. And that was a very specific choice when I was writing those poems. My rule is if the word can stand on its own, like wind out of windshield, the hyphen goes, gets dropped. If it can't, then the hyphen goes there. But if I can fake you out and make you think that that word is complete as it is and then drop the hyphen, I'm going to do it every time. Yeah, it's such a, it's it's one of those defining experiences because that's that's an idiosyncratic choice, I think, to have the, the hyphen down like that. And what it does is it, it feels so intentional and so designed for exactly that effect that, that it becomes, um, I almost, like the rule that you described carries within it the assumption that that head fake will will generate meaning right that it will not just be like i tricked you but instead and i think this is true i think you're absolutely right to suggest this that it is instead a way to proliferate the meaning making of the line in that way and i think that's so that's so fantastic um I am, I'm looking at us and we are a little bit past time and i'm not seeing other hands from folks so i will just um maybe end our, our, uh, our event tonight by noting a couple of things in the chat, which include Drew, I love the language used in your poems from Kenzie and Mary saying, I know a rural commute, a commute on Metro North will be greater observed by me after hearing your reading, Josh, <laughs> thank you. So thank you both for a wonderful reading. Thank you all for coming and being with us tonight and for your great questions. Um, Drew and Josh, it is such a pleasure. Um, have a wonderful week and a great night, everyone. And thank you again. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.